Thank you, Pamela. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, Karen, thank you so much for stepping up and becoming a board member. That is so awesome. You've been a member of our Sangha for so long and yeah, so appreciated. Really, really lovely. And just to highlight this idea that um, it's a volunteer run Sangha. I mean, I, I've had the good fortune to teach in some pretty esteemed places um, nationally and abroad and very rarely when I show up to teach are the people who run the center there. I would actually say <laughs> never, <laughs> right? You get brought in and, and, and folks come, but it's really special um, what we have going on here, this really Sangha forward um, experience of community, I think, and hope that we are an experiment in community and you know, living that idea that the Buddha of the future is the Sangha. Right, that our, our awake nature, nature is actually with and from and through each other. So with that, I'm so happy to be here this evening with you all. Um, yeah, you know, having the transition of Thich Nhat Hanh to uh, energy from matter uh, this last week. And I just felt so deeply that transition and I, I know he would say it's a transition. I, I have a poem to share with you at the end of the evening where he anticipates, of course, this transition of leaving this body in this world. Um, and it made me think so much about Sangha and community and um, just have been rejoicing this week in the stories of friends and, uh, and colleagues and, and members of the Sangha who've gotten to sit with Thich Nhat Hanh or who've been moved by his readings and his teachings and his living embodiment. Such a beautiful teacher. And so tonight we are indeed moving forward in our book. Uh, many of you have been here before. If not, no worries. We are actually uh, in these last couple of weeks and tonight and next week as well, we're covering some pretty core teachings. So we're looking at the, the primary virtues or spiritual qualities. And tonight, our quality that we're looking at is concentration, samadhi, mindfulness. And it's an area that Thich Nhat Hanh wrote about so beautifully. So I'm actually going to invite us to do a practice that I took from one of his teachings that I'm borrowing from one of his teachings, which I think is uh, so well suited for our practice of concentration. So we'll do a sit. And we'll talk about concentration and samadhi. But for the purposes of this sit, I'm, I'm going to do a bit of a preamble. It's an interesting practice he offers. Um, and I want to kind of get you a bit ready for it. So when we think of this, um, this quality, this paramita of concentration, we can think about it, you know, as it makes its way through how we've built ourselves there. It, it's interesting this idea that you know, these, these paramitas actually could build on each other in a way. So we think of possibly how our generosity might help us with a feeling of patience that might help us with discipline, that might help us with joyous effort that then could support this concentration. I've seen that written and I'll, I'll share a quote about that. Of course, we can always be developing them one by one. And concentration or, or mindfulness, it, it can really sound quite intimidating, especially how it's written about in the ancient texts that we need to develop and sustain single-pointed attention, period. Which for many of us can feel like a struggle. Uh, we get a glimpse of it here and there. Maybe we have a really nice practice, but the next day it's quite different. So I really appreciate Thich Nhat Hanh sharing with us. Um, he says in this talk, which he's looking at the four foundations of mindfulness. So we can develop our concentration with anything. We could use a candlelight, right? We could use an image of a great teacher. <laughs> we could use anything to kind of develop our concentration. But we know in the... Uh, the four foundations of mindfulness, we start practicing with the body, sensations, we look at Vedana practices, 
Um, but when we look at the fourth foundation um, of mindfulness, we're actually working with perception. The way we're actually using our mindfulness to start working with perception. And it's really, again, it's, it's quite beautiful how he, he, he suggests we do this practice. He says, essentially, there's kind of three main parts of this, you know, working with this fourth foundation of mindfulness, working with our um, perception. That the first is really being able to recognize impermanence. Something we talk about quite a lot here, yet seem to always need reminding. And so in that, in our practice, we'll spend a little bit of time breathing in and recognizing as we breathe in how everything is changing. Breathing out, recognize how when we're breathing out, everything is changing. And it's such simple phrases, but maybe for those of you who listen to Thich Nhat Hanh, it's like you can hear his beautiful voice saying those simple phrases. And <clears throat> so we'll spend some time kind of contemplating and using our concentration with that level. And then we'll really look at a second level, which um, sometimes is called kind of um, signlessness or being able to have concentration without a projection. The way when I read about it, it's almost like we have no desire, we have no agenda. Breathing in, I release craving. And breathing out, I release craving and longing. He says something incredibly beautiful about this, which is that you already are what you want to become. You don't need to be another person or run anymore. You are the manifestation of the cosmos. So that's a real inspiration for us to breathe in and breathe out without agenda. Where do we need to be? We are there. So that will be our kind of second phase of the practice. And then the third is, um, you know, uh, <laughs> very high level, but it's really recognizing nirvana right here. And the definition that he uses of nirvana or that he describes is um, where there is no death and birth, or the way I understand it is where they are, we recognize that they are not the only part of our consciousness. Um, and that sense of timelessness. And I thought about that a bit. I, I think it is um, timelessness is a non-ordinary mental state, but it's not unusual. I think all of us have had a sense at one time or another of, of timelessness. It doesn't mean we, we recognize per se transcending birth and death, but it's that sense where we're no longer preoccupied with who we are or what we're doing, and there might not even really be an us. I feel like this state is for me easier to achieve in nature when I'm kind of caught up in a different pattern of recognition or a different way of existing with what's around me. So I wanted to give us a moment to really consider because, you know, just saying the word, okay, we're gonna breathe in with Nirvana and deathless nature and breathe out. But I wanted to give us a moment to really think about that. So. Before, before we move on, anyone have a sense, like could I, if I see for folks who are here, like a show of hands, do you know that feeling, that kind of timelessness feeling? Is that something you can relate or resonate to? And if, and if not, um, any questions about how we might be able to kind of help ourselves land with that sense? Because again, this will actually be a practice that we're using for concentration. So concentrating on this idea or concept of deathlessness. And it actually slides into, or the final phase of our practice is to release all concept and to just concentrate uh, essentially um, on the truth of interbeing, on non-separateness as, as Thich Nhat Hanh would describe it. So we give up all of our notions or concepts um, and rest in that. So that will be our concentration practice for this evening in honor of dear Thich Nhat Hanh and of course, honoring his teachings by practicing them, which um, 
he offered so beautifully for so many people. Um, so these are our kind of three types of samadhi, three types of concentration on the fourth foundation of mindfulness. One thing that's mentioned in this chapter is that the practice of concentration, of course, is a mind and body practice. That it's not a practice we can do by just efforting through the mind. And that it's really important as always, but we'll remind ourselves again to have a posture that can really support us in this practice of concentration. So I invite you here, I'm gonna just read from the chapter that the legs should be crossed. I don't agree. The legs should be in a way that feels supportive. Ideally, you have a little bit of cushion underneath uh, your hips, even if you're sitting in a chair. It just helps the natural uprightness of your spine. And the eyelids should be lowered and the eyes should be kind of either gazing down the line of the nose or softly closed. And really, again, kind of checking in that you feel a sense of uprightness. For myself, I notice when I get relaxed in practice, I actually lean a little towards my left. So to kind of get ourselves um, into that upright posture. Having the shoulders level, so not sloping backward, not sloping forward. We might wanna just inhale our shoulders up to our ears and exhale them down our back couple times, maybe twice more. Feeling up, then feeling them naturally fall. One more time. Hmm. And checking in that the chin is just slightly tucked, really invites our gaze downward. And some of us already naturally do this or have instruction in this, but it can be helpful for our practice to have the tongue just resting at the top of the palate right behind the teeth. And then a feeling of real relaxation. <clears throat> I always uh, invite folks to give themselves as much space as they need around the waist area. If you have anything tight or constricting around your waist, allow it to loosen just a bit. And then making any last adjustments so that you can really feel that your body can settle into as much stillness, which is comfortable for you. Let's begin right away by arousing bodhicitta. Remembering and reminding ourselves why we come here to practice together. That sense of both delight and responsibility to open our heart. And inviting our attention and awareness to pour into the space of the body. And for a couple moments here, simply noticing whatever can be noticed through the space of the body. 
mm, tactile sensations, maybe of warmth and coolness, or sensations of energy and movement. while still noticing the sensations of the body. Narrow your focus and attention a bit to follow the inhale and the exhale as the breath travels in and out of the body. As we narrow our focus in this way, we can invite our inner speech or dialogue to gently settle. Feeling the support of our body from beneath us. We can invite a sense of spaciousness and openness to the mind. Part of developing our concentration is being able to rest. And part of developing our concentration is being able to introspect and to notice when the mind is no longer at ease, when it's caught up in a distraction or it's become spaced out, dull or lethargic. So we'll take a moment here and notice is the quality of our mind right now. Does it feel busy and active? Or maybe a little tired, dull or spaced out? Then we can apply a remedy. If we feel busy, high energy, we inhale and through our exhale, we allow ourselves to relax and release. If instead we find ourselves tired or spaced out, on our inhale, we focus, inviting vividness, and then gently exhale. So we can use these remedies and this introspection throughout our practice, checking in and noticing, are we still concentrating, developing our samadhi? Or might we need to apply a remedy, get ourselves back on track? Inhaling and focusing for vividness or exhaling and releasing for ease.
We'll gently shift now to our different objects of concentration. Beginning, we'll breathe in and recognize that everything is changing moment to moment. With each breath, breathing in and recognizing impermanence, Seeing if we can remember that everything is changing as we breathe in and continue remembering that everything is changing as we breathe out. Even this very next breath, so much has changed since the breath we took just a minute ago. Notice how this remembrance can shift and change. Maybe it begins with the words, breathing in and knowing everything is changing, breathing out, knowing everything is changing. Maybe it shifts to a felt experience of change, an image of change, or a knowing.
Now we gently shift. Breathing in and releasing ourselves from craving and longing. Breathing out, releasing ourselves from craving and longing. Remembering that you are already what you want to become. You don't need to be another person or run anymore. You are the manifestation of the cosmos. Breathing in and knowing you are already what you want to become. Breathing out knowing you are the manifestation of the cosmos. Keeping this as the object of concentration, breath by breath. From this experience of presence, releasing anything to come, we shift now to contemplate nirvana. The experience beyond birth and death, breathing in, knowing our deathless nature. And breathing out, knowing our deathless nature.
Nirvana is not somewhere else. It's right here with us fully awake to right here. And while feeling the momentum of our concentration, see if we can continue to steady the mind while releasing the concepts. Concentrating on our deathless nature here and now, without needing the words or the ideas. Relaxing into the experience of being. Breath by breath by breath.
Thank you for your practice. Any questions, thoughts, or reflections? You can raise a physical hand, a digital hand, a chat, but you can't unmute yourself. That we discovered. Yes, Geneva. Um, thank you for the meditation. It was wonderful. I, it was pretty amazing. Um, I got really lost in my power strip, the light on the power strip, focusing on the light. It just took me away. Um, just, I was like merged, flying with it. And then you started talking about breathing in change and out change. And as I'm still in the light, my cat comes on to me. It was like the perfect change. Change is here. But it was just, it was joyful, you know? It was a, she was part of it all. And then you went into the nirvana and it was like the perfection of the moment. It was just really highlighted in how there's these moments throughout our day if we just stop hmm. and recognize them, be with them, stop the cranking mind and be in that moment. Oh, thank you. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Leanne asked the essential question, why is concentration so hard? I think it is so hard, period. Um, I think that's always been true. That's why the Buddha spent so much time teaching us all these different tools and techniques. Um, and you know what we see pointed out in these instructions is the things that are some of our biggest obstacles. For me, maybe everyone has a, a different one, but for me, that second one really allows me to, to sink in. Who I'm gonna become or what comes next is such a source of distraction, right? You know, okay, well, what, what you know, what, what's the next thing that's gonna happen and what's the next thing I'm gonna do? And, you know, from, from very mundane to greater plans. Um, so I think there's a lot of concentrations hard because it's hard for us to accept that we already are the manifestation of the cosmos. I think concentration is also hard, maybe needless to say, because we live in this contemporary environment where our attention is a commodity. And there is a lot of very savvy, very smart, um, kind of forces at play that are interested in taking our attention away from the present moment to something else. So I think it, it's arguable that it, it might be harder than ever. However, luckily, these are the skills, these are the tools to develop our concentration. Um, and I think it, it can't be overemphasized that the practice of developing our concentration. I'm saying concentration and attention. I, I do think of them pretty synonymously. Um, you know, samadhi, <clears throat> another word there too, which is, you know, often translated as a calm abiding. Um, these terms, you know, they point to a skill that we're developing in order to rest our mind, but they also speak to every time we are coming back when our mind is not resting. So we're not not doing a concentration practice when we're bringing our mind back. That's part of the practice. I know for many of you, you've heard that a lot, but I, I think it's really important to emphasize that. Um, Denise asks an incredibly hard question that I love. What is the relationship between equanimity and nirvana? I think that's a, a yeah, it's really interesting, you know, because with equanimity, it's... Um, it's, you know, this, of course, this ability to be with all things as they're changing and moving and coming and going. 
whereas nirvana right sometimes is described as um extinction so it's not like managing the things like the things have ceased so I'd, i think they have a similar flavor i'd love to hear if anyone else has a thought on that but that's that's my i have a gestalt feeling of the difference between them but that's the words that are coming to me of what's different it's the difference between equanimity and nirvana I see Pamela thinking about it. What do you think? I, that is such a good question, Diane. I have so much respect for equanimity. And I have no idea what Nirvana is. <laughs> <laughs> she said, though, when the question was asked out loud, she said, I think they're the same. Uh huh. Just saying, reporting in the privacy of our home all of a sudden. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Both. <laughs> the reported and not reported. Yeah. Um, I do think it's interesting to think about the gestalt feeling of it, right? With with equanimity, I feel like I'm I'm able to respond, right, with love or with compassion or with joy, with whatever is coming. Kind of, I feel like I'm. This is a terrible analogy, so excuse me, but you know, like in the matrix, like moving with everything that's happening. Whereas Nirvana, um, I, get, I just keep having that word extinction, you know, like everything has just ceased. Um, so I'm not managing the things around me. I'm, I'm, but it's not as though I'm unfeeling. So yeah, I, I'm gonna have to think about that one a little bit more. I love the question. Any other thoughts or reflections on why concentration is so hard? Yes, please. Um, hi. I, hi. <laughs> I, I, I think that nirvana is something beyond our mind. It's nothing, we, we cannot think about it because it's, it's a very peaceful place, I think. <laughs> At least for me, in my idea of nirvana, peaceful and it means peaceful because you're not thinking mm -hmm. you're not making up stories mm. you're not going anywhere you are just quiet and let nirvana come to you mm. it's not that you're going to nirvana nirvana comes to you and only the idea makes me breathe better. Hmm. Beautiful. Thank you. Hmm. Claudia. Just a comment. Um, the second step made me feel really good. I mean, it gave me a lot of spaciousness, especially when you were saying that we're a manifestation of the cosmos and we're already there. Years ago uh, in Mexico, I was in a yoga session and I literally, I guess we were in meditation and I literally felt that my, I don't know, I had left my body. Mm. It was a really strange, strange sensation. And I like to think that when I die, I'll go back and be part of the cosmos, you know, but I mean, as it is chem scientifically, as you know, we already have the elements. I mean, nitrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, carbon, all of these elements that are in, in, cos in the cosmos. So I, I really love the idea of like going back and being again, I mean, being mm -hmm. part, part of the cosmos of 
So I was imagining all these galaxies, I guess all these infinite, it, it gave me a lot of space and it was, it was just really wonderful. It was very, very peaceful. So thank you. So welcome. Yeah. Yeah, I wish that for all of us as well. And I think the, the leap Thich Nhat Hanh is asking of us is don't wait until you die. <laughs> feel that here or feel that, you know, the kind of the dying that we experience day by day, you know, that kind of um, moment to moment. Yeah, really, really a beautiful um, practice to focus on it right? Because we can focus on anything. So why not focus on that possibility here and now, uh, which feels enriching. So, you know, our, all of our uh, practices of the four measurables are concentration practices. And for many of us, it's easier to practice our concentration in considering the compassion um, that we feel for others or for ourselves than it is to, yeah, you know, focus on, um, a candle flame or the sensation of breath at our nostril. So I think when we're considering concentration and how to develop it, since it is so essential, um, we really can um, remember that there's a lot of ways to do so. I, I do think, you know, of course, uh, I, I can't, I have no idea, but I don't think the Buddha could have imagined the unbelievable, um, tax upon our focus, attention, and concentration that would be happening these days as a result of the world we live in. But more than ever, developing our concentration and attention is so important. Maybe some of you have experienced um, as you develop practice and become a practitioner that you can actually sustain focus for longer periods of time. And that it's not only is it productive, it's great, but it also allows you to actually show up for other people in your life and for yourself. And there's a lot of aspects of attention and concentration, enormously beneficial and supportive of things that matter to us. And it can be really tough um, to feel that concentration attention, even coming here together, you know, being on a screen for an hour and a half um, at the end of the day, it's a practice of concentration. Um, not trying to call out anybody who's also online shopping right now. It's okay. <laughs> we all do it sometimes, but you know, we can, we can develop this in a lot of ways. Uh, Walt says Nirvana equals the equivalence of everything and no thing or nothing. Mm. And Paul says Nirvana, there's no there there. It's everywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Leanne, I see your hand is raised. Yeah, I've been wanting to ask you about, um, I know you, you just said there's many paths to concentration. And of course, there's many types of meditation. I started with like a Goenka course, and that feels like such a specific and then I stopped doing that. And I have recently been coming back and I find it um, sometimes like very helpful in terms of grounding and focusing. And then sometimes I almost feel like this is anti-meditation. I'm like, like I'm focusing so hard on something so specific because it's like the body scanning and in this particular mm -hmm. order. And I know there's no better or worse and it's all different traditions, but I guess I'm just sort of curious because it's such a different practice. Like, and I don't know your insights or just teachings on like the, the nuances within Vipassana and like what different practices offer or, you know, cause that's also a very rigid sort of world. Yeah. 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 I don't know if that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, I really, yeah. Thanks for that question. I'm, I'm sure um, many folks here have both ideas, experiences and, um, and similar questions. You know, it's so kind of cliche, but you know, they say the best practice is the one you do. Um, and I have to agree but or and, I actually think it can be really nice to mix it up. Um, so to have a full week or maybe a full month in which, you know, Goenka's practice, I think it's, I think his primary and root teacher is also Mahasi Sayadaw. Um, and so I've sat with a number of Mahasi Sayadaw teachers. I haven't sat with uh, a Goenka retreat, 
And, you know, those practices are very um, structured and specific. And I find that sometimes I just light up for that. Um, and I don't want to just do it once because it takes a while to kind of, it is a different style, right? To kind of, okay, all right, this is our order. And so I would just really recommend, you know, um, with, I wouldn't, I, I'd say that there can be an upper limit of doing too many different kinds of practices because we just can get confused. But if there's a handful that are enjoyable, giving yourself, like I said, like a week or a month of like, yeah, I'm really going to focus on this one. And then it might just be that we want to, it's like an apothecary. We want to change it up. Um, for me, I know that, you know, if I'm sleeping well, if I'm feeling well, I'm like Dzogchen all the time. That's my favorite practice. It's like very inviting, open, um, just feels very light in terms of uh, method. And that feels very um, good for me. But if I'm, you know, experiencing a lot of pain and hardship, I might need to go back to an immeasurable practice or not back, but I to a practice with a lot more structure and a lot more heart. Um, and then there might be a time where, you know, I'm feeling agitated and I really want that just body scan, that simple grounded experience. So I think, I think it really is good to start feeling like, you know, we, which is true, we are the best person to tell us which practices to do um, night by night or day by day and kind of feeling into, um, what's working for us. So I hope that's, that's very helpful. Freeing. Yeah. Yeah. Because the goal, I think the school's a little evangelist, like, you know, he's like, don't mix it up. This is the one <laughs> or whatever. And so it almost like, then I almost feel like I can't dabble with it. And I think what you're saying definitely resonates a lot more, but there's yeah. sort of value in all different kinds. And do you know, do you know Dharma Seed, that app that has like all these free teachings? There was a teacher, um, Stephen Smith, who I, I've gotten to sit with a number of times. And he has, I think, 111 Dharma talks on Dharma Seed or something. It's a lot. And he's Mahasi Sayadaw, but with Metta. Like there's a, there's a loving softness there that I think comes from him sitting a lot of hard retreats for 30 years and realizing the need for heart. So that's someone I've really found to be, because I, I sometimes really like that, you know, so when we're talking about Mahasi Sayadaw and Goenka here, we're talking about, you know, style of practice that is like really specific and really structured, and often really hardcore, you know, upwards of 11 hours of practice a day on retreat. And there's a lot of benefit in that in terms of developing concentration. So just, um, just to say that, yeah. Thank you. And it can make people feel really rigid and uptight and burn out hard. I've seen a lot of that too. So, you know, all the things. So a little more, maybe a lot more on concentration here. Yeah, I, um, found this beautiful quote um, by Trungpa, which is like funny, not in this book, but um, I just wanted to share it on the, on the paramitas. I thought it was so lovely. Um, yeah, so he, he really, he kind of flows into how these build upon each other. So again, we're at concentration, but we're building on everything that came before. So he says, with generosity, you open yourself and give away everything, including yourself. Out of that naturally grows transcendent discipline. With discipline, you do not have to get tied up in your generosity. You don't have any hangover from giving too much, and you don't develop any heroism from giving so much away. Out of discipline, comes patience. You control your aggression by means of shamatha and vipassana, and by means of realizing absolute and relative bodhicitta, you develop non-aggression. Out of patience grows exertion, which is having a sense of joy in and appreciation of your livelihood and your practice. After exertion comes meditation, concentration. The meditation does not mean just sitting on your meditation cushion. Meditation means that the cushion is sewn to your pants. 
So it goes with you everywhere. Instead of wearing, um, instead of wearing a crucifix, you might sew a cushion onto your shirt or to your pants so that you always have an awareness of meditation. It's as literal as that. So I, I just I love that. <laughs> Sewing the cushion on, right? And bringing it with you. And I just love that flow. Um, you know, the next virtue that we'll go with next week is wisdom. And it's wisdom, you know, essentially none of these virtues really have any power without the wisdom underneath them. So it's all, you know, this kind of lovely moving together, um, all of these together, you know, and the wisdom, because if we're doing meditation, and maybe this is back to your question, Leanne, if we're doing the meditation um, in Goenka style meditation, and we're really tight with it, you know, we don't have the wisdom to see that kind of ultimate reality. We're just, I need to get this. I need to do this. I'm striving. Then it's really no good at all. Like any, even generosity, if we're doing it in order to get something back or to be a good person, it's not, it's not actually a spiritual quality. It's a transaction. So the wisdom really, you know, all of these are going to be um, infused with that wisdom. Um, Pamela and or Mace. I see a, a hand raised. It just, I could not comment because last week with Chandra, she was saying that one of her favorite things was this teaching that Mila Rapa was giving. I think it was Mila Rapa. I don't remember the teacher. May says it, it was, was Mila Rapa. Giving the last teaching of this one famous student who he was sending off and he just like pulled down his pants and he showed like the grooves on his sit bones, <laughs> on, you know, but from sitting so long. And then here you're bringing up like sewing a cushion. So I just had sewing to a cushion is nicer <laughs> though, I think. Like yeah. Synchronicity you guys got going. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah. it was like a callus on his butt or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. And you see, you know, uh, you've heard the stories of these like t uh, older Tibetan women whose, whose fingers have the imprint of the mala beads. Right from just the Omane Padme Hum, Omane Padme Hum. It's like their fingers look like the mala beads themselves. Um, yeah, and I think um, it is nice, you know, to have. It's it's not easy for for all of us to um, have a place in our home where we can keep a cushion, but to have that place where we're coming back and kind of like settling in and um, yeah, I can really start to get a sense of the continuity. So I'm gonna turn to the chapter here. Did I realize, I think I missed one comment, which was about something on page 95. So Denise says on page 95, I'm just gonna try to go back there. Hmm, maybe 195? I'm not sure, maybe Denise, you can let me know what that was. It's, it's the top of page 95. It's about Tong Lin. Oh, okay. it's just this really powerful, sentence that i missed before mm. and uh i realized if it was if if i can get to that that would be uh, i see there are some extraordinary pith instructions that explain in more detail how to make this practice more effective um and so the question is like wh where are those or yeah if there's a reference or if those yeah. were discussed in some simple way <laughs> yeah that. well this is, this is dogo kensei rinpoche my guess is he is referencing actually the Lojong slogans. Um, so which we were, were doing um, most of last year. So those 59 slogans, which train us in Tonglen. But I really think, you know, Pema Chodron's instructions on Tonglen are incredibly clear, step by step. Um, you can find them online. I think on Lion's Roar or Shambhala, they have um, her kind of description of those really beautifully that she is taking from Lojong. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Did Pamela and, and or Mace raise their hand again or is it still raised from before? Okay. All right, so I will say I was, um, you know, it's interesting. I was, uh, I was surprised by the first selection, um, the chapter or the kind of piece on concentration, it it starts off with a kind of intense 
um, selection about giving up our attachment to wealth, to bad company, to the sen and um, to objects of the senses, then in praise of solitude, before even getting to the practice of concentration. So kind of three, three paragraphs before you can even get to practicing concentration, like almost like the housekeeping you have to do. But as is often the case with some of these uh, ancient texts, they don't mince words whatsoever. So in the giving up attachment to wealth, the fleeting pleasures of this world are like canopies of clouds that appear one moment in the sky and are gone the next. People immerse themselves in these enjoyments, claiming they are necessary for their livelihood and indispensable for their survival. And yet the life of humankind is no more than a flash of lightning, a swiftly passing interlude, which can in no way be extended beyond its term and is all the while attended to by the three sufferings rampant like a gang of thieves, the suffering of change, the suffering of suffering and all pervading suffering in the making. Whew. So uh, it goes on to say that, you know, essentially our, our desire for sensory pleasure and enjoyment um, is keeping us constantly tormented and exhausted. That our desire to accumulate and preserve our possessions um, makes our minds just polluted by desire. So that's our first teaching on concentration. I will say, I, I don't necessarily always love the intensity sometimes of how these are described. And it's always a nice reminder, you know, the things that we desire and we crave and often the bigness that they hold in our minds. Yeah, it is a distraction. Now, if we need, for example, like a new water heater or, um, you know, some, some material object that supports our very well-being, we should want that. It's, it's not saying that any material object is um, leading us down this road of torment, inner torment. Um, but, it, you know, and that um, I, think, I think one thing it tries to point to is that often the accumulation of wealth is at the consequence or kind of on the backs of others. And so it is interesting to think about, um, you know, what we are materially possessing, what we're acquiring and what the cost is. We think about the karmic load, um, which is not really part of what he's describing here. He's really just describing the fact that wanting things ties us up in a longing and a desire that makes it so hard for our mind to be free. And then very pithy and not very nice. <laughs> he says, on the whole, ordinary people are foolish and behave like spoiled children. Their mind streams are clogged with wrong thoughts and their actions are unvirtuous. They praise themselves and say unpleasant things about others. They are filled with the venom of defilements. Their attitudes and conduct are as poisonous as the snake tongue. They are surrounded by the harsh atmosphere of conflict. So I think it's an overstatement to say that on the whole, ordinary people are this way. And, and I'm and this any idea of like ordinary and like separateness, I, I don't love. Um, and, you know, I do understand, you know, trying to connect to mundane relative reality it, it can be um, I don't know if it's filled with the ven venom of defilements, but it, it is it can be pretty um, unenriching for a practitioner. And it's something you know we've talked about here at the in the Sangha before, which is you know as many of us are on our spiritual path, that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone we love is as well. Um, and how do we engage and communicate with those that we love and care about when maybe we don't relate to values or choices or ideas? Um, and here it's saying that it's, a, it's, it's in the way of our concentration. So I think that's a little bit um, up to us in a way, like we don't, we don't wanna abandon those that we care about. That would be against our bodhisattva vow. 
but also thinking of how much getting kind of caught up in mundane concerns. Like, do I care if people like me? Do How am I being judged? How am I being seen? Um, especially when that's just at the kind of the level of materialism. Yeah, it, it really can get in the way of our sense of well-being and our concentration. And then giving up attachment to the senses. Um, until one is able through the practice of clear insight to tame the elephant of one's mind which is intoxicated and driven wild by the deceptive poisons of desire objects. One will never perceive the latter's defects. They always appear as positive qualities. So what's interesting is these next two are kind of, these two pieces are together. Being able to recognize um, just in some ways how unsatisfying a lot of sensory experiences can be. He suggests that it's only um, that when we're in solitude, can we kind of develop a weariness of samsara, which um, my teacher Jennifer well Wellwood often calls, we have to kind of grow a revulsion for samsara. We have to have a sense not like, oh, I should give up, you know, junk food and, um, you know, talking poorly about other people, because I know that's the wrong thing to do, but my spiritual practice, but to really develop a sense of almost nausea with samsara, with this constant seeking of pleasure and desire for power and wanting to kind of one up all of the ways that um, we get kind of trapped endlessly in day-to-day -day realities that have nothing to do with our deeper well-being. So this idea that we need, we need solitude, um, which for some of us, we got a little bit more of um, in the early parts of the pandemic and maybe that did help our spiritual path or maybe it just made us feel uh, anxious or otherwise and then finally he moves on here to the actual practice of concentration and i will say that um, it's beautiful um, he says that keeping the mind balanced and equipoise and focusing it exclusively on the specific object of concentration without letting it stray elsewhere, without letting it lapse into blankness. The object on which the mind should focus may be with or without form and from time to time, one should investigate and make sure the mind is focused on its positive target. So that's what we did in the beginning of our practice together was this kind of introspection, noticing if the mind felt like dull and lax or if the mind feels too busy and he says that one engages alternately in the practices of kind of this introspection and then the resting in meditation. Um, so this idea of what exactly is kind of calm abiding, when the mind remains in a state without torpor or excitement, dwelling one pointedly on its object, undisturbed by thoughts, this is calm abiding. The perfect recognition of the mind's nature of primal wisdom, the absence of clinging um, to the object of concentration. And he says here that shamatha and vipassana take part in the same nature. Shamatha is the one pointed concentration, and vipassana, vipassana is the perfect discernment. So, this is, again, I have to say, a little surprised to have so much emphasis on concentration on these giving up into the material world. Anyone else have a thought on that kind of harshness towards our attachment to the material world, to others? Jenny. Wait, wait, I'm turning this down. I um, I think that the pandemic, and actually I was just talking to my mom about this, how um, because of the supply chain, our attachment to access has been, uh, and especially at the beginning of the pandemic, was greatly diminished. And I think that it's not a bad thing because we're so spoiled yeah. to uh, 
I work in the wine industry, it's really hard to get glass. You know, and everybody's used to having this exact glass that they really like. And guess what? You're going to get the glass we can get. And I think that, um, you know, you mentioned spending a lot of time in solitude more than any of us had expected to. And even still two years in, three going on our third year, right? Almost. Um, yeah. So accessibility and just this lesson in like, It's just not always everything all the time. I don't know if that made any sense, but that's my yeah. thought. Yeah. For example, I can't find coconut milk anywhere. That's okay. It's okay. No, it's it's it is true. And and again, I don't I don't love the intensity, I guess, of the words um, and the kind of especially it just feels like it's putting people down. And yet um, I do appreciate the pointing out of what what is it we really need and and you know and surrounding ourselves by um conditions and causes and people which support kind of wholesome behaviors it does help right it really does help um, so you see paul asking does ordinary mean versus monastic i don't think so i think ordinary just means non-practitioner like folks who are engaged in the everyday uh, world. Um, <laughs> I, I do love this line. Part of me that is in contempt loves this line. On the whole, ordinary people are foolish and behave like spoiled children. <laughs> I mean, it's like, that does account for a lot of behavior I see in the world. It's true. Um, so, Jason. I saw you for a moment, Jason, but now I don't see you. Oh, there you are. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I, I was. I was unmuted. I was muted. Now I'm unmuted. Uh, but I was. I was saying the. Um, that a lot of the practices that are very rigid. This feels like it's coming out of this very intense, rigid thought pattern. But if you add the element of compassion, mm. like because because in a certain sense the description of ordinary people is clueless, basically, right? is like saying, if, if we let ourselves say clueless, but in a sense, we all are, we are all clueless, then right. the compassion opens up and you're like, you know, cause I, in a way I feel the same. I feel like if I walk around judging people as clueless, that's not a healthy spiritual path. But if I say I am as clueless as everyone else and identify a little bit with like the humanity of it, then it's a more compassionate approach. And I, I think when you mentioned bringing in compassion, I, it seems like that's really necessary in yeah. all of this. No, I love that. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And I do, you know, this in praise of solitude. I mean, of course, it's wonderful to be somewhere truly far away. Um, but solitude meaning giving ourselves some space to ourselves so that we can kind of naturally reflect and see what's wholesome and unwholesome. Solitude actually doesn't mean being on your phone in a different room from your person you live with. <laughs> like real solitude where you're actually giving your whole mind, body and heart a rest and some time. Yes, Lindsay. So I also, when I read that have just an aversion to the kind of it's it, it smacks a little too much of like hellfire and damnation turn or burn sort of the Baptist world I grew up in in Texas and um and I also noticed that you know when you were talking about um being motivated by like well I should do this because it's the right thing versus sort of getting to a place of revulsion that kind of language also inspires that kind of like I should mm feeling in me where it's like the short-term motivation, but it's not coming from a real place. Mm. But then as we're talking about it, I'm thinking of it more like, I just watched um, Don't Look Up 
and there's a great scene. Yeah, so there's a great scene where Leo DiCaprio is like screaming at the like you know he's on the news and he's like basically you're all like we're all gonna die like listen to me you know like what are we doing and just loses it and in that way I'm thinking of it like if there's one person if that if there's one voice like someone's got to do that yeah right and so if it's gonna be if I would probably listen to this teacher more than I would any other person right like if it's gonna I'm still gonna feel aversion to it but it's like someone's got to be screaming and being like y'all get a grip so I'm trying to kind of like reorient to it uh, and just talking about it is helping me see it that way yeah I appreciate that and you know I think we all went through it reading Shanti Deva's guide good body guide to the bodhisattva way of life because it is so fire and brimstone. I mean, it's so intense and, and it does, it feels hyperbolic and right. You do in some ways have to scream at the top of your lungs to get our attention, right? It is, it is hard to get out of the, the stupor one would say of just kind of day-to-day comforts and seeking the next thing to kind of avoid this discomfort and go to that discomfort. And um, if, you know, just this idea that, you know, life is this lightning flash, just so fast. And if we aren't attended to and attending towards the true causes of happiness, we miss it. Um, and that, that is sobering, it is helpful. Um, and then um, Walt saying, yes, what we in the first world see as material non-attachment seems ridiculous to the 40% or more of the world surviving on less than $5 a day. Yeah. And even that kind of, you know, um, kind of clear seeing, cutting through reality of like, hey, it's okay, right? Um, I think it can be, it's interesting because we're actually getting towards wisdom, which makes sense. Like we're kind of talking here about, can we infuse wisdom into our day-to-day experience? as a way to help with all of these practices. Um, there's some really, there's some really beautiful um, phrases in here um, that I just, I wanna share with you on, on page 127. Um, Tenzin Norbu, some of you may be familiar with Tenzin Norbu. Um, he says, as you practice sustained calm, you will experience the gradual pacification of the mind in five steps, which are illustrated by five similes. Meditation like a waterfall, pouring down over a cliff, the thoughts continuously follow one another, at first seem even more numerous than usual because you've become aware of the mind's movements. Then meditation like a river rushing through a mountain gorge, the mind alternates between periods of calm and turbulence. And then meditation like a wide river flowing easily. The mind moves when disturbed by circumstances, but otherwise rests calmly. And then meditation like a light, like a lake lightly ruffled by the surface ripples. The mind is slightly agitated on the surface, but remains calm and present at its depth. And then meditation like a still ocean, an unshakable, effortless concentration in which antidotes to discursive thoughts are redundant. Sustained calm can momentarily limit negative emotions, but cannot eradicate them. Their full uprooting can be achieved only by the discriminating insight that recognizes the true nature of all phenomena during meditation and that is aware of everything as empty illusion during post-meditation. Sustained calm is thus the concentration aspect of meditation while profound insight is its wisdom aspect. So kind of like hinting towards wisdom. So it's not only concentration, right? Not only developing that calm stillness, but recognizing obstacles as illusory. Like what gets in the way of our calmness again, thinking we are not manifest as the cosmos, thinking there's somewhere else to go, something else to do. 
So we need both this aspect of concentration and insight um, to have true shamatha. So I really love that. Um, I want to share a poem with us from, from Thich Nhat Hanh, just such a beautiful, um, such a beautiful poet. And I just happened to be reading his book of poetry um, just two weeks ago. And this was one of the favorite poems I read and has brought me a lot of comfort in his transition. And the poem is called Oneness. The moment I die, I will come back to you as quickly as possible. I promise it will not take long. Isn't it true I am already with you as I die each moment? I come back to you in every moment. Just look, feel my presence. If, if you want to cry, please cry. And know that I will cry with you. The tears you shed will heal us both. Your tears are mine. The earth I tread this morning transcends history. Spring and winter are both present in the moment. The young leaf and the dead leaf are really one. My feet touch deathlessness and my feet are yours. Walk with me now. Let us enter the dimension of oneness and see the cherry tree blossom in winter. Why should we talk about death? I don't need to die to be back with you. We can dedicate our merit, our time together here. So considering the reflections and practice we've shared here together as true fuel and motivation to keep working on our concentration, developing samadhi, so we can support the reality of every being, knowing a sense of calm, every being experiencing safety, belonging that every being would understand the causes of happiness and be free. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful to be together. Next week, wisdom. <laughs>